Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 59, Kill the Reformer. Well, today's episode is uh, being recorded from an unusual location for me. Uh, it's in Roseburg, Oregon, and uh, it's between the towns of uh, Tacoma, where I was just at from my father's memorial service, and the town I live in, which is Reno, Nevada. Uh, while I was up uh, at my parents' house, I came across a number of different photographs, you know, of the past, as most people do. And what was very interesting is I stumbled upon one picture, and supposedly was taken by a member of our family, and it was of Tsar Nicholas II uh, getting into a car. Uh, my mother's side of the family did live in St. Petersburg. I was able to get more information on where they lived. And as soon as I find that out, I would love to get some help from some of my listeners uh, so I can get maybe a Google Earth picture of where this little island was that they uh, lived in. Because as I understand it, uh, St. Petersburg is a number of different kind of islands. And I would love to be able to find out more pictures while my mother is still alive and show her uh, where did our family live in St. Petersburg. Uh, a little bit more interest in it. And I was also able to find some fascinating books that are written in both Russian and English uh, about the history of Russia uh, from the Russian perspective. Of course, much of it is from the Russian Orthodox Church. So, you know, they have their biases, as many of us do. So uh, as time goes on, I'm going to be sharing these photographs that are in this book, scanning them in, in these books, actually, and sharing it with my uh, Facebook fan club at the Russian Rulers uh, History Podcast uh, Facebook group. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to uh, rebuild my website at markshouse.com as we've been getting a number of uh, unusual hits on there trying to uh, access the uh, database through nefarious means, but that's okay. Uh, we've got some good... Uh, programmers behind the website and we'll work on that but what I'd like to do now is get to the uh, latest episode last week an assassination attempt on Alexander II the great reformer changed his point of view on all the reforms he had introduced to Russia but the one set of reforms he had to continue were the ones he began with the military given the immense resources in men and material the Russians they should have just easily beaten the Allies in the Crimean War. The Allies threw 70,000 men against the walls of Sevastopol. Yet, if the Russians had any transport system, they could have thrown 700,000 against them. But the archaic weapons, the lack of roads, and incompetent leaders doomed the brave soldiers who held the city. Alexander, given these circumstances, first decided that the officer corps needed reinvention. Instead of the old system of social status and age controlling who would be officers, a merit system was instituted along with new military schools being opened. While this was an important improvement, it proved to be too little, too late. The peasants, for their part, were growing more and more disillusioned with their supposed freedom. They hated the communal system, which is ironic, as this was the system that the Soviet Union implanted or implemented decades later. Riots and uprisings continued throughout the land, oftentimes brutally crushed by Cossack militia. But Alexander seemed to be oblivious to all of the grumblings, as his advisors kept everything under wraps so as not to disturb the Tsar. This control of the goings-on with the people was to plague the last three Romanov rulers. The radical movement was gaining momentum, and their weapon of choice was assassination. First major attempt was made in 1878, when one Vera Zazulich shot the chief of St. Petersburg, wounding him seriously. But she was found not guilty by a sympathetic jury, but was quickly sent to Switzerland by her radical brethren to avoid almost certain rearrest. 
In Russian society, it was a golden age, as the arts flourished with such literary works as Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, along with the brothers Karamazov. Tolstoy wrote War and Peace, along with Anna Karenina, and Turgenev, Fathers and Sons, as well as works by Goncharov, Ostrovsky, and Saltikov Shehedin. In music, we have the first performances of symphonies by Tchaikovsky and the wonderful melodic works of Balakirev, Borodin, Mzorsky, and Rimsky-Korsakov. In art, Perov, Repnin, and Kramos Kramskoy adorned museums and wealthy benefactors' walls. Alexandra also made a concerted effort to raise the Romanov family status in history by updating historical locations, such as the Novospassky Monastery, where the first Romanov, Tsar Michael Fyodorovich, waited with his mother after he heard that he was selected to lead Russia by the Zemsky Sabor after the Time of Troubles. In 1872, on May 30th, a large celebration was held on the 200th anniversary of the birth of Peter the Great. Alexander sought to link himself with Peter. He also had a statue built in honor of Catherine the Great as well. He was dead set in making his family the only one to lead Russia because of history and God. Alexander sought to increase the Romanov mystique with all these hearkenings back to their glorious past. So his next action is frustratingly puzzling. His wife, Maria Alexandrovna, the former Princess Marie of Hesse-Darmstadt, mother of their eight children, was exceedingly delicate, which kind of didn't suit the Tsar, so he openly took a mistress one Princess Ekaterina Dolgerukaya, a member of the old Dolgeruki family, descendants of the founder of Moscow, Yuri Dolgeruki. Now, this is really not that unusual. All the previous male Tsars had a consort. I mean, even Elizabeth I and certainly Catherine II. What was puzzling, puzzling, and, and frustratingly stupid was his flaunting of the relationship. This angered many in the Romanov family, causing some to be openly hostile towards Alexander. In July 1880, just one month after his wife died, he married Princess Dolgorukaya. No one, of course, from the family was in attendance. The emperor's aunt was noted to have said that, quote, I shall never acknowledge that impudent gold digger. The Romanovs owned Russia, and any other Russian who thought they could join in on the fun was sorely mistaken. Alexander was to have four children with his second wife. This kind of concerned the Romanov family when it came to their continued domination. Even though Paul I's law of primogenitor, primogenitor laid down the law as to the rules of dynastic rights, everyone knew that the Tsar could change the rule at any time and name his second wife's children as his heirs. But going back to what I found really stupefying is that this disregard for proper behavior was to change public perception of the Tsar. No longer was he the proper little father. He flaunted the rules of etiquette and the law handed down by God and the Orthodox Church. The people's dissatisfaction with the Tsar was fermenting, ready to explode. The serfs were frustrated as the land they were given as an adjunct to freedom came with a 49-year bill to pay, a bill few would ever repay in their or in many cases, their children's lifetime. While Alexander had enacted many reforms, they only opened the jar partially, while the pressure contained within Russia demanded that the lid be taken off completely, which it would 
30 years later. Now, the assassination attempts started coming out hot and heavy. Aside from Karakasov in 1866, we have two attempts in 1879 to blow up the imperial train by the People's Will terrorist group. Both would fail, one due to sheer luck. On February 1880, a bomb exploded below the Tsar's dining room, but again, Luck's hand helped Alexander, as lunch had been delayed. Future Tsar Alexander III remarked upon seeing the carnage, quote, A pitiful sight. For the rest of my life, I shall not forget the horror. The incident helped shape his future reactionary reign. Things in 1880 from there were peaceful after the attempt in part due to a brutal crackdown on dissenters. Now, February 18, 1880, marked the 25th anniversary of Alexander's ascension to the throne. While festivities were celebrated throughout Russia, the mood within the family was somber. The Romanovs were under attack from the people of their own country. Alexander now believed that repression was not the answer but further reform was necessary. He wrote to his wife at the end of February, I have signed the manifesto. On Monday morning, March 14th, it will appear in the papers, and I hope make a good impression. At least the Russian people will see that I have given them all I possibly could. And all of this is thanks to you. Now this was 1881. And on Sunday, March 13th, and this is by the new calendar, our calendar. It's different under the Russian calendar. But after March 13th, 1881, after he attended a military parade, he passed the Catherine Canal when an explosion rocked the imperial carriage. Despite pleas from his guards, he came out to see how badly hurt his other guards were and to talk to the now captured assassin. Ryaskov, when another assassin emerged, throwing a second bomb at the Tsar. An officer first had said, Thank God your majesty is safe. Alexander responded, Yes, thank God, but look at these. When the second bomb exploded, ripping a hole in the emperor's stomach, blowing off his legs, he groaned out, Quickly, to the palace, to die there. At 3.50 p.m., Grand Duke Vladimir stepped out onto the balcony of the palace and announced that Tsar Alexander II was dead. What the assassins did not know was that he was about to propose a constitutional monarchy. But that would not happen, especially with the ascension of his son, Alexander III. But before we get to his son, we need to better understand what Alexander II had really accomplished and the burgeoning revolutionary thoughts that were permeating Russian society. According to many historians, Alexander's reign could be divided in two, the liberal, reform-minded period and the reactionary post-assassination attempt period. I feel it's a little too linear and strict of a definition. Reforms actually did continue throughout his time on the throne, and his reactionary and conservative policies were cons consistent, and they were truly the mainstay of his reign from the beginning to the end. Much of the po really positive things that Alexander accomplished were thrust upon him as opposed to him seeking out the changes. His ending of the Crimean War is an example, as he really had no choice. He had to come to terms with the Allies. Others, like the ending of serfdom, were inevitable. The reform of the military was of absolute necessity. But at least Alexander was open to it. And this is unlike his father, Nicholas I. While Alexander was in power, Europe underwent a number of changes as well. The nation of Germany was created under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck, and Austria-Hungary was formed. 
Serbian and Balkan rebellion fermented, which led to war between the Ottomans and Russia in 1877. And of course, leading to the spark that caused the start of World War I. After the 1877 war, first the Treaty of San Stefano was signed, but not put into effect until the Congress of Berlin supposedly settled things. This Congress was led by Bismarck and attended by people like Benjamin Disraeli from Great Britain, Gorchakov from Russia, and others. This Congress did not do the Russians any good, but again, their hand was forced because of the financial crisis that was besetting the country. In Asia, the Russians continued their expansion in the Caucasus, Central Asia, and the Far East. In 1867, Tsar Alexander sold the rights of Alaska to the United States for $7.2 million, in what we called in the U.S. Seward's Folly. China, reeling from rebellions within and attempted partitioning by Great Britain and France, ceded large tracts of land to Russia. The city of Vladivostok was part of that game. During his reign, despite attempts at censorship, a great deal of revolutionary ideas cropped up and was shared by members of the middle class and upper class intelligentsia. One highly influential person was Mikhail Bakunin, an early anarchist, who became somewhat of an influence and inspiration to the likes of Lenin. It was a sort of golden age of revolutionary ideas and thoughts breaking the old traditional Russian beliefs. You have to consider some of the literary names that we mentioned before who spread these ideas, like Dostoevsky, Turgenev, and Tolstoy. Join me next week as we begin our review of Alexander III's 13-year reign, a reactionary period due in part to his father's assassination and the short time he had to groom for his ascension to the throne. And now, for a reading from Russian history. This comes from the historian Mikhail Pogodzin about the impact of Peter the Great. Yes, Peter the Great did much for Russia. One looks and one does not believe it. One keeps adding and one cannot reach the sum. We cannot open our eyes, cannot make a move, cannot turn in any direction without encountering him everywhere, at home, in the streets, in church, in school, in court, in the regiment, at a promenade. It is always he, always he, every day, every minute, at every step. We wake up. What day is it today? January 1st, 1841. Peter the Great ordered us to count years from the birth of Christ. Peter the Great ordered us to count the months from January. It is time to dress. Our clothing is made according to the fashion established by Peter I. Our uniform according to his model. The cloth is woven in a factory which he created. The wool is shorn from the sheep which he started to raise. A book strikes our eyes. Peter the Great introduced the script and himself cut out the letters. You begin to read it. This language became a written language, a literary language, at the time of Peter I, superseding the earlier church language. Newspapers are brought in. Peter the Great introduced them. You must buy different things, they all. From the silk neckerchief to the sole of your shoe will remind you of Peter the Great. Some were ordered by him. Others were brought into use or approved by him, carried on his ships, into his harbors, on his canals, and on his roads. At dinner, all the courses, from salted herring, through potatoes which he ordered grown, to wine made from grapes which he began to cultivate, will speak to you of Peter the Great. After dinner, you drive out for a visit. This is an ensemble of Peter the Great. You meet the ladies there. They were admitted into masculine company by order of Peter the Great. Let us go to the university. 
the first secular school, was founded by Peter the Great. You receive a rank, according to Peter the Great's table of ranks. The rank gives me gentry status. Peter the Great so arranged it. I must file a complaint. Peter the Great prescribed its form. It will be received in front of Peter the Great's mirror of justice. It will be acted upon on the basis of the general reglement. You decide you decided to travel abroad, following the example of Peter the Great. You will be received well. Peter the Great placed Russia among the European states and began to instill respect for her. And so on, and so on, and so on. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please go to iTunes and give me a favorable rating, of course. That's if you like what you hear, as it's going to help me move up the podcast rankings and get more subscribers. Also, don't forget to join us on our growing Facebook at the uh, Russian Rulers History Podcast Group, where you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. But now, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.